Your slides are too visual. That's the problem. Again, your slides are too visual. We have a problem. That's what I'm told many years ago as I'm facilitating professional development to 300 teachers. I was going to do really good UDL, and I was going to really have lots of multiple means of representation and action and engagement. I was going to make my slides so different. They were not going to be documents in slide format. The bullet point was going to be banished. And I did a good job, I feel, because this person came up and said, it's too visual, I, we have a problem. And I want to get defensive, and I want to say, oh, wait, 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 have you heard of UDL and, and all of that? And there are lots of other ways that you can access this without text, and there are other ways that can be more meaningful and quicker in understanding. But then he goes on, and I held back, and I didn't go there, and he says, I'm speaking for my colleague here. She has visual impairment. Her computer screen reading software can't make heads or tails of your visual slides. She doesn't know what's going on. And when I hear that, it's a good thing that people with visual impairments having enhanced super hearing is a trope and not necessarily true because she would have heard my heart thump to the ground. Because when I heard that, I felt terrible. And then he continues, she's so nice and she doesn't want to make a big deal of it and she wouldn't have, but I'm speaking up for her. You know, she needs that. And then I feel even worse. Oh my goodness, what have I done? Teaching special education is hard enough as it is. A special educator is 10 times more likely to leave the field than a general educator. And this hardworking teacher has visual impairment on top of that and is doing a great job. I can't even begin to imagine have empathy for someone in that scenario. And when I heard that, I just felt terrible. And it's too bad that UDL fail, that thing wasn't a thing back then, but now I would have felt a little bit better. And what did I do wrong here? I wasn't accounting for the variability of the professional learner. So what does that mean? Who am I targeting? Who am I focusing on when I'm designing professional learning? In Santa Clara County, where I'm from, the average teacher is white, female, teaches elementary, has 13 years of experience, is roughly about 40, 41 years old, and has a baccalaureate degree plus 30 credits. Who matches that perfectly here? Huh, nobody. I particularly am very deviant. I don't match a single part of that at all. <laughs> oh, okay. So interestingly, that's the average, but if you really look at the data, we have 15% of our teachers in the county are either first or second year teachers, 15%. We also have 25% of our teachers slated to retire within the next five years. So they have a lot of experience. So, you know, who is your average teacher? I don't know. And when we're designing professional development, what's happening here? You know, oh, you know, we have great thoughts about it. And we spend a lot of money. As a country, we spend $18 billion a year on professional development. And we've been doing it over and over and over again. And yet, in some studies, 90% of teachers report their professional development as useless. 90%, what's going on? So professional development, unfortunately, has become a compliance activity, something that we can check off as, yep, I did it, and it's quantity-based, not quality-based. And that leads to some implications here. When it's compliance-based, we're doing professional development as a learning goal. Writing the standard on the wall before every lesson, that is a performance goal. We want learning goals. Teach the standard well to all students. Only one of those type of goals leads to mastery. We want learning goals. We know that for students, 
Students can learn helplessness. They can become frustrated. They can feel like they're not in control, that they have bad interactions, nothing's going right. Are we also teaching learned helplessness with our professionals? Teachers report that PD is something done to them. They sit, they receive information given from someone else. The topics are potpourri of oftentimes competing goals and initiatives. It's chosen by someone else, not engaging. So are we teaching learned helplessness here? And keep in mind, a quarter of our teachers have a lot of experience. They've gone through this a long time. So what can we have done about that? Well, there's good news. There's a bright new day in professional development. We're gonna call it professional learning now. Instead of us doing development to the teachers, we're gonna engage them in active professional learning. So now it's no longer PD. We don't call it PD anymore, bad word now. PL, okay, professional learning, okay? And part of that is the micro-credentialing movement, online micro-credentials, and it sounds fabulous. Menu of choices, menu of many, many choices. You know, content-driven, relevant, timely, consistent, assistive technology built in. Wow, that sounds awesome. And we joined that. You know, we have the California One Initiative, and I apologize again that we weren't able to see it in the big room, but here's a screenshot of it with our courses and our resources and so forth. So we're on that. Now, we still want to be careful, though, in designing our new professional learning opportunities to reflect some of the things that we've learned from PD. So here are some considerations for all of us. I'm going to present the candle problem. Now, this was first presented in the 1930s by Dunker. I'm presenting you with a box with tacks, a book of matches, and a candle. Your job is to attach the candle to the wall and have the candle lit, continue to be lit, and not let the wax drip onto the floor or the table there. How do you do that? Well, that's the solution there. And when they do this experiment, people usually get it in a range of five to 10 minutes. Now, experimenters do something really interesting here. They'll offer a monetary incentive. If you're one of the top quarter people doing this, we're gonna give you money. And they make it pretty sizable so that you have an interest in doing so. And if you're the fastest person doing this, we're gonna give you a lot more money. What happens here when we tie that? Interestingly, performance goes down. And not just a little bit, but quite a bit. On average, three and a half minutes longer. Keep in mind, the average person does it between five to 10 minutes. That's the range of all the people who complete this candle task. And on average, when we provide the monetary incentive, it slows down by three and a half minutes, despite people trying to do a quicker, better job. So that has a lot of implications for first then. As a special educator, I use first then all the time. What, like, what's going on here? Here's another part of this, though. When we can get monetary rewards to work very well here, there's a nuance, though. When we offer the monetary rewards, we have to actually say, and present it like this. If we take the thumbtacks out of the box and onto the table, then, in presented in that scenario, people finish it much quicker when offered a monetary incentive. It's now become something routine. Oh, quick, I can figure it out. You don't have to really think through it and try and experiment and all that. It's become much more routine. So when we really look at it, when we have a first and a then, first you do this and then we'll offer you this, it works very well for routine work. Routine work that you just have to spend some time on. You don't really have to think, you know, kind of like busy work, non-engaging work. You know, there's always one straight pathway. You know the steps, it's linear, you can get it done. However, when we have non-routine work in which we have to really think about this and try and fail and experiment and try another way and so forth, monetary incentives do not work. It narrows our thinking. We try, oh, I'm gonna do this quick, I'm gonna do this quick, and you try to focus, but guess what? Your focus is narrowed. You can't think out of the box. You can't be flexible. You don't try new things. 
Another example, preschoolers who love to draw. Experimenters then offer certificates each time they draw and say, great job, and really praise them well. Doing this for two weeks, those same preschoolers no longer like to draw anymore, interestingly. Because we tied it to, again, an external reward, that non-routine process of drawing, of experimenting, of exploring, they don't want to do that anymore. Giving blood. Interestingly, when you tie monetary rewards to giving blood, it goes down. Because when we tie a monetary reward to it, it's no longer a gift. It's no longer something that I intrinsically want to do because I enjoy it and I want to give back. So people give less. However, we can get blood giving, blood donating to go up. How do we do that? We have to eliminate the barrier to giving blood. So when you make it so that the people, participants, can have time off from work, blood giving goes up because they naturally want to give, they naturally want to provide that gift, and now you've removed that barrier of I need to be at work so I can't go and do what I want to do. But if you give them time off from work specifically for that, they will go, but not a monetary reward. So it's intrinsic. We don't want extrinsic. Extrinsic is routine work. It's straightforward work. And for truly expert learning, UDL processes, we want it to be intrinsic to us. So we, instead of expert learners who are purposeful, motivated, resourceful, knowledgeable, strategic, and goal-directed, we want expert professional learners to, to do the same. It's no longer routine compliance work. It's no longer performance goals. We want learning goals, and that takes time. So again, we're going back to our California One, and what are we doing here? So these are some of the things that we considered. We have blended learning, and it's a combination of online and face-to-face. -face. And originally, we had thought that it was going to look like that, much more online than face-to-face. -face. And we'll provide face-to-face -face as needed. However, even though we're in Santa Clara County, home of Google, Apple, Silicon Valley, all that, we're not at the tipping point here. This is still too new for most people. We're still at the innovator and early adopter stage. We have to get to that tipping point before everybody starts joining in. So we're not there. So it turns out that we're having people say, I can't do this online. I just, I just not used to it. You need to come lead face to face. And that's fine. We're going to do that. So instead of it looking like that, we've had to adjust. And now it's more face to face with the online. And if you can do it online, great. We'll honor that. We also have to continue to sustain learning, coaching, and relationships. Even though it's online, we still need that. We can't have it be one and done. We can't mis make those same mistakes again of traditional PD. Now that it's the new professional learning environment, we have to sustain that. So we had already seen this for UDL. It's going to be sustained. It's going to be scaffolded. And it's going to take a while. Notice how level four is coach. So you're going to be coached. It's going to be a relationship. You're going to have that so that you can get to mastery. There's going to be UDL fails along the way, but that's OK. That's part of it. So we have the coaching set up on learning design and California One. And if you notice, coach, we have goals. I have resources, team member, calendar events. And you can invite people into the coaching group and so forth. We also want to remove barriers. Because again, we're not at the tipping point. We are at innovators and early adopter stages. So we have to remove every barriers. We can't have those situations where you feel like you want to smash the computer or throw it out the window, OK? We need to minimize the steps. Have single loss sign on. Think about how many steps does it take to reach any part of the module. And reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it. Keep it simple. In the context of where we are right now, and especially with online learning, for online learning, we have better standards. We know YouTube, we have Instagram, we have Twitter, 140 characters. So in that context, we judge things presented online differently. We judge it to a higher standard. Our attention spans have been lowering, decreasing anyways, but for online stuff, it's even more decreased. 
So we compare it to compelling things from other online sources. So we have to keep that in mind. We can't make it be a traditional PD or a textbook or an arts dense article and just plop it online. We have to design differently. So I'm going to present the coffee test. Okay? When we see something online, we have five seconds. You have five seconds to look at something and decide, is it worth my time to do it now? Or am I going to first get coffee? Then I'll come back. However, you never do. You never come back. That's the coffee test. You have five seconds, OK? Every time you're thinking of designing something online, putting it on there, think of the coffee test. Is someone going to look at it, feel overwhelmed? I don't want to do that right now. I'll do it later. I need coffee. Or as our good friend, Dr. Jose Blackerby said when I presented this, he said, I want to go to happy hour, get tequila. So the tequila test, if that's you know, where you would like to go. We want to avoid that. We want to make it so that when it's presented, it's engaging, it's interactive, it looks good, it's designed well, and you feel like, I got this, I can do this. So here are in some examples from learning design. You know, it's laid out simply, it's not too overwhelming, it's interactive, you have choices, you're led through it, it's not your traditional online course. So over the years, we've been asking the wrong question. We've been asking, how do we make professionals implement UDL? How do we make professionals do something? The better question, the new question that we should be asking is, how do we foster professionals to become expert professional learners? Thank you. <laughs>